this is an alternative opening. Um, it shows the history of naughty children and their nannies. My wife actually played uh, the Japanese nanny, um, but it was considered to be too long when we put the film together and we just wanted to get on with the story a little bit quicker. So that's the reason why it was cut. We must begin our story, sad to say, with a brief word on the subject of ill-behaved children. As I'm sure you are aware, there have been troublesome offspring since the beginning of time. Take, for example, the case of Bog, the horrid cave child. Or, for instance, little Achmet and Ramses, the vicious twins of ancient Egypt. Horrible to relate, Obu, Nobu and Shobu, the vile sisters of medieval Japan. So many stories, so little time. Let us turn, therefore, without further ado, to the brown children of Finchley Lane in the London suburb of Totteridge, whose legendary unpleasantness we are about to examine in greater depth. The brown children, whom we shall meet momentarily, were all very clever and all very badly behaved. They... But first, a word on their progenitors. Their mother, Mrs Brown, through dint of her heroic childbearing efforts, was, as is so common in stories about children, dead. Their father, Mr Brown, worked from dawn till dusk, seven days a week, as a makeup artist at the local funeral parlour, Midgewaller and Sons. Unfortunately, the wage from this establishment could not begin to cover the costs of seven children, which was why his income was amplified by a monthly allowance from his late wife's aunt, Lady Adelaide Stitch. A warrior by nature, Mr Brown had thought that his family crisis could not possibly get worse. He was wrong. Ah! They've eaten the baby! Derek Jacobi and Patrick Barlow's double act as, as Ween and Jowls was proven to be so entertaining that Emma wrote another scene. Um, it didn't make the cut in the end because we just wanted to keep the story very focused and keep everything moving along. Um, but this scene shows them locking up the undertakers late at night and they're discussing whether the next morning they should still continue to jump out of their coffins to frighten Mr Brown or whether they should take the dramatic decision to jump out of the cupboard. <laughs> I've, uh, I've had a bit of an idea, Mr Jowls. What's that then, Mr Queen? Well... Next time, let's hide in the cupboard. What, not in the coffins? No, the cupboard. It's unexpected, see? Oh, I mean, he won't be expecting us. If you catch my drift. <laughs> am I sensing concern, Mr Jones? I admit I am concerned, yes, Mr Ween. You oh. read me right as ever. It's just that... Coffins is more humorous than cupboards, to my way of thinking. And if, if you're asking me, Mr Queen... Oh, I am. I am indeed. In my humble opinion, coffins is funny and cupboards ain't. Oh, right you are, Mr Jones, right you are. Coffins it is. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Brown left early this evening. He did, without bidding us adieu, I noted. Odd, that. Very odd. <laughs> this next scene was, was filmed for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, it showed Evangeline uh, attempting to post a letter to Mrs Quickly. Um, but there were a number of letters featured within the film, and at one point we found that the letters were getting very confusing, so that's one of the reasons why we cut this scene. Um, but the other reason why this scene was, was written and, and filmed in the first place was to throw Evangeline and Mr Brown into a more um, intimate situation than they would normally be used to. This was to give the audience the sense that Mr Brown and Evangeline might be coming more romantically involved with each other, but when the film was put together, it was clear that 
um, the performances from from Colin and, and Kelly were doing this anyway, so it didn't seem necessary to show them getting closer in in the scene. Listen to this, dear. I am coming with the express intention of easing your financial burden. Maybe she's thought the better of my having to remarry, cost of a wedding and so forth. Perhaps I won't have to go through with it after all. This is quickly. Evangeline. I'm very sorry, Evangeline. May I just have the, um, quickly, quickly, the... Thank you. Thank you. I thought that letter was urgent. Well, no, I'm glad you mentioned that because, well, it was urgent, but, well, no, it might not be. No, what I mean, no, no, what, what I'm I trying to say... I know what you're up to, to Mr Brown. On, and on considering a, a... what you're up to, perhaps it isn't sensible to be seen walking about in public arm in arm with your scullery maid. Once the children have prevented Mr Brown from marrying Mrs Quickly, Mr Brown soon realises that Aunt Adelaide's allowance is about to stop. So he starts to gather a number of possessions together in his house with a view to selling them. And we introduce a character called Mr Sapless, who's a very dodgy local businessman. Uh, I'd worked with David Kelly on Waking Ned, and he'd very kindly agreed to um, to come over from Ireland to, to play this very small part, which made it even more difficult to um, to cut the scene. But when we looked at the film um, as a whole, it just became very confusing to introduce a new character for, for such a short scene. Nice face, this. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I couldn't possibly part with that. That's, that's, that's... Excuse me, could you not? It, it's just that, that that's particularly... Um... Give you a sovereign for it. A sovereign? And I fear we have no choice, dearest. Did you just call me dearest? In an attempt to explore the double act between Ween and Jowls, I improvised a scene where they were handing a, a letter over to Mr Brown. Uh, but again, this was one of the letters that we felt were confusing the plot of the film. And unfortunately, although this is a very fun scene, it, would, um, it had to be cut. Mr. Ween. Thought we'd get you that time. No, not this time. <laughs> nice tea dance, Mr. B. Oh, lovely, I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> you was accompanying a lady, I take it. <laughs> One of the widows, perhaps? <laughs> no, no, I didn't even get there. Disaster. Children, you know. We do know. We've said it before and we'll say it again, Mr. B. It's not funerals as you should be in the business of. It it's Christmas. <laughs> Oh, another lady dropped by this morning with a billy do for you, Mr. B. Oh. Mrs. Oh. Elton, it was. Oh. <laughs> do you remember her, Mr. B? Oh. 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 <laughs> Widow of Mr. Frederick Elton. Oh. <laughs> she was in a right old lather, she was. Yo, but don't worry, Mr. B. Plenty more fish in the sea. Good morning. Just excuse me a moment, would you? Dear Mr. Brown. I sat at Mrs. Riley's entirely alone for one and one half hours yesterday and can only say that a person who has subjected me to that degree of social embarrassment should not be asking for second chances. Yours, etc. Mrs. Prudence Elton. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. What's your wife like? Never mind. Less than a month ago, there's nothing for it. It'll have to be that woman, the dreadful one. One of our editors put together a version of the um, of the tea party and presented it in a way so that it looked like a, um, a silent movie. He sped up the action and made it black and white. And it was a lot of fun and we tried it in one of our screenings but we found that it confused some of the children um, to have such a dramatic change in style. Um, but it's worth looking at anyway. <laughs>
This next shot is part of a deleted scene and shows Cook relaxing in the kitchen, safe in the knowledge that Nanny McPhee has got the house under control. What none of us knew was that Colin Firth, who had finished the film two weeks earlier and I believe was on holiday, uh, secretly returned to the studio, dressed up as Nanny McPhee in full makeup um, and made a surprise appearance um, in this shot. If you look very carefully at the staircase um, in the back of the kitchen, then you'll see Colin Firth making his debut appearance as Nanny McPhee. Lesson number six. When you've finished a job, stay away and never, ever, ever come back. I'll be here as long as you neither need me nor want me. Good night, children.